Respected panelists, excellencies, distinguished guests, and delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Today, I welcome you all to the BIPS Roundtable on Role of Media in National Security. The moderator for today's roundtable is Major General A.N.M. Munir Zaman, NDC, PSC, retired, President BIPS. And the speakers of today's roundtable are Zafar Sobhan, editor at Dhaka Tribune. Shudiv Chakraborty, Director at Center for South Asian Studies, University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh. And the last speaker is Brigadier General Shahidul Anam Khan, NDC, PSC, retired, former associate editor at The Daily Star. Now, I would like to request the moderator to carry on with the rest of the session. Thank you. Very good morning to all of you. And a very warm welcome to this monthly roundtable of peace to the division. And this morning we are discussing a very important issue, and that is the role of the media in national security. A critical aspect of the state which intersects with media is national security and media. We all know that the media comprises of newspapers, televisions, radio, and more recently, digital platforms, which serves as the primary bridge between the government and the government. It is the media's responsibility not only to inform the public, but also to act as a vigilant watchman, holding those in power accountable for their activities. In this context, the media plays a critical role in maintaining transparency, ensuring responsible reporting, and more. National security is not merely about protection of our physical borders, it is also something that encompasses safeguarding our values, rights, and privileges. The media is a fourth state that begins with this endeavor by providing the citizens with the information they need to make and to form decisions about their safe rights and contribution to the national economy. However, the role of the media in national security is without, not without challenges. In a world of instant information and social media, the line between credible news and disinformation can often be blurred. Dissemination of false or sensitized information can lead to panic, erode public trust, and even compromise security measures. It is therefore imperative both for the media and the consumers of news and information to exercise critical thinking in all aspects. We shall be discussing all these and more because we have a very informed and enlightened panel today. And without further ado, we shall start with the discussion. And the first speaker in the panel will be Zafar Sobhan, editor of Bhakta Tribune. Zafar, here for you. Thank you very much for coming in. Um, I should say that uh, the main subject here is going to be. Go ahead and make a big topic which I've been asked to address. And I think it's in Bangladesh, it's a very important point because, so far as I'm aware, we have no public accountability when it comes to defense spending, when it comes to defense matters at all. It is Military matters, national security defense is, is almost a black box here in Bangladesh. It's not something which is debated in Parliament, it's something the debate in the media, in civil society, which is discouraged. We really don't see that many platforms for informed debate. Certainly, there have been efforts made. This, um, uh, uh, this monthly 
a round table which BIMS hosts is one of the efforts to do so. I was a colleague of, um, uh, of uh, Bhavidya Anand when he was the um, strategic and defense editor, I believe, was that uh, your, your title in the Daily Star, when uh, we tried very hard to bring in strategic and defense uh, matters into a national newspaper. And I think that was a, that, that worked very well in so far as it went, but I think it's something you notice hasn't really been taken up by the newspaper since then. And, you know, one, one uh, point I'll make is that our defense budget here in Bangladesh is close to $4 billion. But if you were to ask people, especially the average person in the street, let alone people in the media, you know, what is this $4 billion spent on? No one would be able to tell you. And I'm not sure that if you were to ask our um, elected leaders, those who are uh, entrusted with debating these issues in the public sphere and parliament, whether they would be able to give you a good answer to that as well. And it's a real, it's, it's, it's a question which needs to be asked because $4 billion is not a small amount of money. And if you use uh, Myanmar, for instance, as, uh, as, an, uh, as a counter example, which is uh, right on our border, Myanmar's budget is $2.7 billion. But from what I understand, and I'm, I'm, I'm with many more knowledgeable people than myself, um, here, both on this panel and in the audience, I feel that in many ways our, you know, our military readiness is is uh, is not sufficient to combat uh, combat that in Myanmar. That has had severe uh, um, implications and repercussions um, up to and including the um, uh, the genocide which was unleashed on the Rohingya people in 2017, which I think was partially motivated at least um, in the uh, the Myanmar. Uh, government in military way involved in it by the fact that there was a big military mismatch between Bangladesh and Myanmar at the time, therefore that they could in fact get away with uh, uh, um, instituting this kind of a pogrom without fear of any kind of military action um, reaction from Bangladesh. In the past, of course, there have been um, uh, there have been many such uh, pogroms in the 1970s and 1990s uh, against the Rohingyas, but usually what has happened is that there's been a negotiated settlement and that many, if not, uh, if not all, if not most, but uh, many of them have been eventually sort of repatriated and moved back. This has happened in the past. But uh, because, the, uh, from what I understand, there's a, there's a disparity in, uh, in uh, certainly in air defense, and I think. I understand correctly, that's the specific area of disparity, that um, not fearing this, this is one of the things which is involved in the Myanmar government to uh, embark on their pogrom and uh, genocidal policy in 2017, and of course we are still facing the consequences today. Now, so these are the kinds of things which I feel we are, um, as a country, um, weakened and um, uh, by not being able to discuss in, uh, in, 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 in public, not to be able to discuss at the highest levels, and the fact that this isn't a part of the national discourse. Now, partly the fault is, I wouldn't say the fault is entirely with uh, the military, I think the fault partly lies in our society, um, and, uh, the culture of Bangladesh, the culture of governments, the culture that we have, I have many things, the oversight of many of any kind of uh, government spending really doesn't get as much um, as, as much uh, a play uh, these days as it ought to, and I think there are negative consequences. And you could argue that this is just one of those examples, but perhaps an example which uh, an example which has more adverse consequences than others, or perhaps long-term adverse consequences, especially when it comes to a national security. Um, but obviously, you know. Public policy in even um, forums such as these, which we hope will eventually impact public policy, how it seriously does um, it contribute to the distance between the Bangladesh military and the Bangladesh citizenry, which is also, I think, something which is to be, uh, uh, to be regretted. And um, I'll give you another example where I think this is very relevant, and that is to do with the fact that um, Taka Tribune for instance, is one newspaper, and I'm sure that there are others, who actually take a heterodox stance in terms of Bangladesh's military preparedness 
and uh, security considerations. In conventional wisdom passed on the liberal intelligentsia, and you see this, I think, in, in most of the administrations, is that, well, you know, Bangladesh is a developing country, we're a poor country, we need to be spending most of our resources on development, we need to spend our resources on education, health, and these kinds of very basic things. We don't really have the time, space, or, or budget to spend money on, 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 on our 21st century military. Our position at the time, attributing this to the opposite, we feel that as a rising power, it's very important for Bangladesh to actually have a very healthy and generous military budget. And only when we can, uh, when we can, um, uh, when the security of the country can be assured through military matters, uh, will we be able to truly uh, think of ourselves as a secure uh, country economically and on equity as well? And the two things are strictly strictly linked. So that here we have a newspaper which is in fact in favor of a greater military spending, which is, as I said, unusual among uh, newspapers, perhaps in Bangladesh. But I still find that getting the information I need to make this argument, which is an argument in favor of the military, in favor of military spending, in favor of uh, more attention to national security and defense, is difficult for us to make because we simply don't have the data. We don't have the information we need to really push this argument. So you know, even, uh, so I would say that the current culture actually amplifies even against uh, those who think that national security and defense should be a foremost concern of this country. In certain times, it should be in times too. Um, when you talk about fostering national unity for national defense, that's also an issue which, um, uh, where the media and the military relations do play a role because uh, simply put, this is a little further away, no, that's a little better, yeah, absolutely, this one might be right, is that um, national unity is, of course, crucial for national defense. And on certain issues, we need to have the country speak with one voice. Now, obviously, not on all issues, and, and even on, 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 on international issues, there is room uh, for, for disagreement, there is room for difference of opinion, but certainly unity when it comes to issues such as uh, security issues, such as defense, is something which is uh, which is crucial. And to foster this national unity, that is, again, a role which the media could play, and, um, and the media ought to play. And I feel that right now, that there is, regrettably, a, a gulf between the media and the military, and a gulf between um, the citizenry and the media. And I think that's, uh, that's very regrettable, because I think the gulf doesn't really come from philosophical differences. I don't think the gulf comes from ideological differences. I think the gulf really has to do with a culture of secrecy and a culture of distance which really doesn't serve either side, and it certainly doesn't serve the cause of national unity. And I think that's another area in which the media can play a role to try and, um, to try and bring uh, the military and the uh, in the citizenry uh, together. Um, and it's, of course, you know, uh, and, and this is important. I mean, if you look at the history of Bangladesh, 1971, the reason we were able to attain independence was because the, the, it was because um, the Bengali members of the armed forces mutinied, and they, in fact, took the side of students, they took the side peasants, they took the side of the rest of the country. And you know, it was in fact, that's what really transformed what may have been a very uh, unfortunately short-lived um, uh, um, movement and struggle into a nine-month long liberation war, and what allowed us in fact to militarily triumph uh, um, in the end. And you know, it's unfashionable to say so, but even if you look at that uh, today, if you look at uh, the events of um, one American uh, that is uh, January 11, 2007. What we actually saw initially was we saw uh, the, the, uh, the army look at a dysfunctional policy and decide that in order to um, in order to have a good election, which all Bangladeshis wanted, that um, steps needed to be taken. Poll show uh, even today we just had um, earlier this month the IRI released a poll and it showed that the most trusted organization in the country is the army with 86% of the public um, either uh, having a very great deal or, so, or, or somewhat great deal amount of trust in them. 
and you know, and I don't want to draw invidious comparisons with other countries where you know there may be tension between the military and and, 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 and the civilian populations for various historical reasons. That's really not the case here in Bangladesh, nor should there uh, should it be the case when it comes to disaster relief, national emergencies, e.g., COVID, even elections. People do look to the army to provide assistance, to provide security. And as I said, the vast majority of Bangladeshis have a very good um, have a very good um, impression of the army. So these kinds of uh, relations and this kind of unity. Is something which we could, you know, which the media could play a strong role in fostering and uh, in, in making sure that it is uh, and making sure uh, that it is emphasized and amplified. And I finally would like to talk a little bit about international perception and diplomacy. And again, here um, there is a role the media can play because, you know, everything is is related. The uh, diplomacy and the military are essentially two sides of the same coin. Um, international players pay very, very close attention uh, to the military civil matters in other countries as a way to gauge their internal strength and resilience. A country with, which is at loggerheads with its own military or military which is at loggerheads with its own people will, by definition, hardly have any level of preparedness for external challenge. The military and the nation need to work hand in hand in certainly all international players, be they, uh, be they on our borders, be they uh, slightly uh, further afield, do look at this. And they had, um, when they, uh, the, the relationship between the military and, 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 the, and the general population of, the, uh, of any country is something which any international country, any, um, any other country, is going to take extreme um, note of when they decide, uh, when they make a strength assessment or they uh, make a any kind of an assessment in terms of Bangladesh. And this is, of course, going to impact our diplomacy. It is going to impact. It is going to impact the. Um, it's going to impact the uh, parts which are available to us, and it's going to impact our bargaining power um, at the negotiating table on issues. And you know, and right now we have many issues, and we have, of course. Uh, the live issue of uh, the one million Rohingya refugees here in Bangladesh in the uh, state of our border with Myanmar. But as the 20th century moves on and uh, the focus of, 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 of uh, international um, tension becomes more concentrated, I think, in Asia, as I expect it to be seen with uh, you know, the India China border not far from us. This is very important for. Bangladesh to be able to present itself um, as a united front. And the more we're united internally, I think the uh, better we'll be able to meet our challenges externally. And certainly when it comes to national security and defense, therefore the media ultimately can take, uh, can take a leading role in playing this very important part. So I'm going to leave it there. I know both Vijayana and, uh, and uh, Shadeep have uh, very interesting things to say on the subject as well. And I do want to get, get to them and then get to the discussion as soon as possible. So thank you. Lafo, thank you for your deliberation. So I couldn't agree more when you talk about accountability. One of the critical roles the media plays is accountability. Accountability of public finance, accountability of actions, accountability of everything that goes about in the public domain. The security today is complex and is multifaceted. So therefore, it cannot be left to a single entity to do everything. There are other actors in the state that has to play equal role in debating, discussing, bringing a discourse on issues of security. One of the points that I mentioned in the beginning that the military is not only about safeguarding the territorial border, the boundaries that needs to be understood, and these are the issues we'll be discussing here throughout the morning. Our next speaker is Shudeep Chakraborty, is the director of the Center for South Asian Studies here in Bangladesh at the University of Liberal Arts. I know we've had discussion with Shudeep for long hours, and he has deep understanding 
of security issues and the security issues particularly in the India Northeast where he has done excellent reporting on critical issues regarding the security of that region. So should you be on the floor for the next 15 minutes. Thank you, General, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm really heartened with the tone that you, General, have said from what Zephyr said, and I'm sure what my other colleagues will say. It gives me great hope that I shall not be deported after my remarks this morning. So thank you very much for setting that very liberal tone this morning, and I think that's in the spirit of our discussion today. So thanks again. Um, Zephyr sent out, a, sort of set out a conceptual kind of framework to the discussions. I'm a more sort of ops kind of guy, if I may use a military term uh, and, and, and use it for a media application. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm very happy about, and I say this as a practicing journalist for nearly 40 years now, um, it's a true story, but, uh, is that I was very happy to see that the Bangladesh Air Force, for instance, and this is sort of a corollary to what Zafar was saying, that I was very happy to see that the Bangladesh Air Force actually took a group of journalists, Bangladeshi journalists, for a field visit, as we call it in, 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 in parlance, to, to uh, a couple of air bases, I could imagine, for a familiarization tour where they would interact with Air Force officers and personnel, travel in Air Force aircraft, uh, hang around Air Force bases, have tea, coffee, whatever, dinner with them, spend overnight and get shipped back. I was very happy to see that because that is not something that I've actually seen happen in Bangladesh very much. There has, to, to, to supplement what Zafar was saying, there is a certain distance, and I think this is a good beginning, where I hope that there is more outreach by various uh, arms of the Bangladesh the Defense of the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, you name it, uh, the Coast Guard, so on and so forth, to actually reach out to Bangladeshi media and actually familiarize Bangladeshi media persons as to what on earth defense or offense or the armed forces and the ops and the people and even the names of the aircraft and the models and people are not aware of these things. I mean, if, if people talk, I've noticed in very general terms about security of Bangladesh and foreign relations and internal security and so forth, but they actually don't know the, 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 the nuts and bolts of what that security entails and they have no idea about how the services work. Uh, who's buying what equipment, modernization, philosophy, outlook, no, very little idea about these things. So there is a very sort of an ivory tower approach, I believe, in the uh, sort of the defense forces of Bangladesh, and also equally, uh, I would imagine an ivory tower approach in Bangladeshi media, which, and this needs to stop in order for proper um, sort of interactions to take place, and I think it's wonderfully placed the country and its security services, and equally its media. I think it's wonderfully poised to take it to the next stage, which I think is a logical extension. I speak as a practitioner of media and an analyst, and I've had the good fortune of uh, interacting with um, the armed forces personnel of numerous South Asian countries, in, somewhat in Bangladesh, in India, in Sri Lanka, in Nepal, somewhat in Pakistan, and also in Bhutan to some extent. And some of my and this essay as a writer and analyst, some of my best information has come from people in the armed forces and the police and the security services. They know what's happening on the ground because it's their business to know what's happening on the ground. I've got bully-headed analysis and information and misinformation and disinformation which we will speak about actually from politicians, from government, not from people who have boots, literally have boots on the ground or both shoes on the ship, so whatever you want to call it, to use uh, straight analysis. But these, I mean, the security forces actually have helped me understand the internal security dynamics in Sri Lanka, India, Nepal, Bhutan, Pakistan, and as we speak in Bangladesh, and that informs me then in also to then engage with the national sort of uh, debate, if you will, or contribute to national conversations about what internal security is, what it means, where it needs to go, and how it contributes to actually Bangladesh's diplomatic outreach, Bangladesh's overseas uh, outlook, Bangladesh's border management, Bangladesh's uh, defense preparedness, and also, as Zappar alluded, perhaps uh, in a worst case scenario to southeast of Bangladesh, 
one which is offense preparedness. I mean, let's not be shy about reaching out to these things, and let's not be shy about debating these things and talking about these things in fora such as this, and certainly in media far more openly. And so I am very, very happy, as I said, I was very happy to see that interaction uh, that I saw, a minimal interaction, maybe a preliminary interaction between the Bangladesh Air Force and Bangladesh media. Good things will come from that, I hope. And I hope uh, our colleagues in the Navy and in the Army take a cue from that and move on with engaging with Bangladesh media in particular. The other aspect that I want to talk about, and here, um, uh, you know, it's sort of, and, and when that happens, and here I come to the first of the points that have been, I've been tasked with, again, to use a military analogy, uh, I am learning them. Um, is you know uh, media's influence on national security policy formulation now? If media is not a part of the policy discussion or this familiarization that begins from the ground up right to the top, then how will media inform knowledgeably that national debate or that information? It's, it's, it's a, it needs to be a virtuous loop. And I think I began by providing that example. The second thing I want to talk about, and which has been given to me, is uh, media's role in internal security reporting works the same way. And uh, again, uh, I believe that the armed forces, going by my experience dealing with armed forces personnel, not just in South Asia, but also outside of South Asia, the definition of what is internal, what is national security has changed. And I think BIPSS in one of its previous seminars actually addressed this issue uh, and discussed it, that you know the whole idea about what constitutes national security has just gone from border management and so on and so forth, into livelihood security, into climate security, into socioeconomic security, into a sort of a, sort of a national confidence of the people of a character. It, it, it all bleeds into what makes national security or what makes robust internal security. I think these discussions need to be escalated in, uh, in Bangladesh, as it has been in other countries of South Asia, in Nepal for sure, in India a lot of that is happening. I personally have been invited to uh, senior ministry level discussions in Sri Lanka, Nepal, and India. Uh, I, I've been invited to command level uh, seminars to actually discuss and brief uh, army personnel, Navy personnel, Air Force personnel about what the media perspective or the civilian perspective is about internal security because that actually informs overall national security. So these conversations are happening across in South Asia in a very robust manner, and increasingly more so. I hope that this also increases in Bangladesh, because it's a very, very necessary uh, uh, situation to, to a reality to happen, because the reality around us is actually hyper-real. We need to be having the discussions, uh, given Bangladesh's uh, needs uh, for its own level of confidence, its future, its growth trajectory, uh, and a sense of security and well-being in the region and certainly in the world. Now, here it is very, very important, and this brings me to my third point, is, uh, as I was given, is media's role in countering or self-disinformation and in misinformation. And being Indian, I claim to have a little knowledge about that, considering that um, back in my country, and Bangladesh is my second home, so my home, or first home, as it were, you have actually uh, a situation where governments have gone ahead and encouraged disinformation and misinformation as part of the strategy of the book here of what's called total politics. And if that transmits to Bangladesh, I can only see bad things happening. So I think it is very important. Uh, and here, uh, the security uh, forces and the armed forces of Bangladesh and the military establishment can actually work with the media to actually ensure that national security doesn't mean you need to conflate government with, with security, or you need to conflate government with nationalism, or you need to conflate a particular government in power anywhere in, in the region. Am I going to get deported for this? No. Good. Uh, just checking. Uh, is, of course, I'm hypothetical. I have a multiple entry visa, so I'm good. And we have a 4,000 kilometer border with India, around Bangladesh, so I have my ways to. This is off the record, thank you. Uh, but anyway, uh, 
jokes about, um, and I'm really serious about this, is that you know, there is a sense that I get, and it's a very disturbing reality that we have in South Asia, unfortunately, is that uh, media is often looked at in a very suspicious manner if it critiques or even suggests or even dares to suggest a path of action or debate or solution or even conversations with the government of the day. And when the government of the day so it takes upon itself and the identity, you know, so the protector of the people, the protector of the national identity, and any critique is taken as being against national interest, that's a very, very dangerous place to be. And South Asia's paid, countries of South Asia have paid a very heavy price for this. India's paying the price as we speak. I sincerely hope that this future is diminished in Bangladesh. I use the words very advisedly. I'm taking my diplomatic cue from my colleague Zafar. And uh, I've seen the price that has been Sri Lanka's paid for this. I've lost a friend in Sri Lanka, uh, Lasanta Vikramasinghe, who was Vikramasinghe, who was uh, assassinated uh, back in 2009 when uh, it was the last days of the Sri Lankan civil war, whatever that means. I don't know what civil war means. I'm just putting it up. Uh, and he was, he was killed by, at the time, the security minister, and I'm on the record on this, it was was Kota Bayar Rajapaksa, who became the president of Sri Lanka subsequently. But anyway, that's another story for another time. But he actually lost his life for saying, daring to suggest that can we please be gentle on the Tamil population of Sri Lanka at this time, because it will not make us look very good. Um, Pakistan has paid a heavy price for that. I've lost colleagues in India who are journalists, practicing journalists, who have paid with their lives Gauri Lankesh is a friend and former colleague who died in 2017 for suggesting that uh, maybe we are a secular country. We, as a Sri Lankan, India is a secular country. We need to be debating with it. National security doesn't mean uh, a sort of a uniform of security or, or a description of governance. Now, I bring these experiences to you because I am a ground zero kind of guy. Uh, yes, I speak at these seminars, but my information is gathered from people like you who are out there and people who actually wear the boots out there. So actually travel to the valleys and the conflict zones of South Asia and so on and so forth and I've done so for decades now. And unless these conversations happen, unless this information exchange happens, unless this sort of level of informed conversations and debate and emancipation and enlightenment happens, then how the hell are we going to go forward? So I think we're at a good inflection point in Bangladesh. Uh, and I'm sorry if I'm rambling at this point, point in time, but let me just say it's a lived experience that I went to. I'm not being theoretical, I'm being hyper real. And I think you ladies and gentlemen know that I speak from where I come from. Uh, and so it is, it is very important. And here I will just end, and I hope there are questions and discussions, but that's the purpose. I mean, uh, I would suggest that maybe the military establishment the media establishment can work together, for instance, to, to, to um, not just speak truth to power, but speak reality to power. I mean, why on earth does Bangladesh, for instance, like India and Pakistan, it's so some occasional fellow travelers, even have a minister for information and broadcasting? That is the root cause of disinformation and misinformation. It's an institutionalized uh, sort of, you're, you're sort of literally creating the ground for misinformation and misinformation. Why does there need to be a Ministry of Information and Broadcasting? What on earth for? We are actually post-colonial in 2023, right? We are Democrats. We are in a republic. These are democracies. Uh, Sri Lanka and Nepal have transitioned, for instance, from ministries of communication and ICT, which is the way to go. Uh, Afghanistan has a Ministry of Information and Culture. Let's set about that for better now, I would imagine. Uh, Bhutan is exceedingly happy, so I imagine they are very happy and they have sustainable information. I will never be allowed into Bhutan now, of course, thank you. But, uh, but even they have a Ministry of Information and Communication, which has gone more from controlling information to actually managing communications, which I would imagine is the way to go, uh, technology and so on and so forth. And Myanmar, uh, what can I say? That there is something, there is actually an animal in Myanmar called the Tatmada True News Information Team. And I'm reading for them, but you will. Uh, I think that's quite funny, actually. I think it's quite uh, 
laughter at this point in time, unless you get one and be using negotiating with repatriation of royal year refugees. Uh, you're up to it. Yeah. So I'm just putting it out there and, uh, and you know, look at the, the reporters without border rankings. Many of you might agree with it, disagree with it. Bangladesh at 163 out of 180. India is not doing much better. India is at 161 out of 180 in media freedom, which is really just bad stuff with the lower part of the ladder. Pakistan is at 150. Nepal, surprisingly, and I was a robust media at 95. Bhutan, very happy at 90. Sri Lanka at 135. Maldives at 100. Nothing much to write home about considering that we have China, Syria, Iraq, North Korea, Iran, and Myanmar at the bottom of that ladder. They take up most of 170 to 180. So this is the time. Well, this is a time and space where I again and again will beseech you, ladies and gentlemen, to, to acknowledge and recognize that we are at an inflection point. And I think uh, dialogue is very important. I'm very, very happy with the IPSs uh, to, to create these platforms for conversations. And I sincerely request that the armed forces and the security establishment of Bangladesh reach out to the media of Bangladesh and create more di platforms for dialogue and interaction. And uh, that will inform, ladies and gentlemen, in the future. That will inform information. That will help to reduce misinformation and disinformation, and so on and so on and so forth. I'll stop here. I just wanted to plant some of these insidious ideas, or seditious, dare I say seditious. Do we have 124A in action? We don't. Uh, but anyway, let me stop there before I truly get reported. Well, thank you, Shadeep for your deliberations. And you did bring out very pertinent points that should be relevant to every country, even including Bangladesh. Modern day SSG or security sector governance calls for high degree of transparency. It's transparency that strengthens defense, strengthens security services. It doesn't weaken them. So high degree of transparency is a positive aspect. Zafar did mention to us that it is the citizens we are protecting. So the media plays a critical role in bridging the relationship between the citizens and the security sector. Because ultimately, we are entrusted with protecting them. So we need a robust relationship, a multifaceted relationship. The other point that I would like to lay before you is that modern wars and conflicts demand high degree of commitment of the citizens. Otherwise, nationals, armies cannot fight battles on their own. When we analyze the Vietnam War, for example, it is very often said that the battles were lost in the campuses of Berkeley because as long as the citizens of the United States did not support the war, the war could not be sustained. So to support and fight modern wars and modern conflicts, you have to carry the public opinion, opinion of the citizens of the country, and also international public opinion. In all these spheres, the media is the critical actor. We have to accept that. And in modern day, the media is progressive. They are everywhere. With citizens reporting capacities, with social media, Media is completely present anywhere and everywhere. The very fact of the CNN factor in modern defense is a reality of life. So modern battles are not won unless CNN says they've been won. So the media has to be closely partnering with the security services. That's why we have come in the concept of embedded journalism, where journalists get embedded in the battalions in the operations. The only thing we need to distinguish is between the degree of policy transparency and operational secrecy. Operational secrecy is something that cannot be compromised. And the media has to be taken on board to understand that aspect, even when they're embedded with battalions and units fighting war. So to understand many of these aspects more in depth, we have a very evident speaker now, who is Brigadier Shadun Aram Khan, who carries a long experience of field experience, of command experience, 
and having been a working journalist with Daily Star for many years. So I give the floor for next 15 minutes. Thank you, Munir. <clears throat> Listen to the <clears throat> sorry. Listening to the two previous uh, speakers and and the summation of the of the chair, it occurs to me that uh, perhaps discussion on uh, CMR, civil military relations, and military military relations, perhaps is in order. It should not be a bad idea to organize uh, seminars on these two aspects. In fact, we have had a number of seminars on civil military relations and media military relations, but those are confined within the military premises. I think it's time that we organize discussions on the military and the media, on the military, on civil military relations uh, outside in, 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 in an environment like this, <clears throat> where nobody will fear. Uh, being deported or coming out with major troops. But my remit is to <clears throat> talk on medium uh, on, on the on the role of the media in national security uh, with three sub themes. I've been given uh, the, the issue of creating national security awareness, national security resilience, and responsible dissemination of information. Well, I think uh, national security awareness and uh, secret resilience are perhaps interlinked because once you uh, achieve awareness, you can then achieve resilience because there, 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 there's an interface. But, but before I go further, I am reminded of a joke. Uh, which stems from the comments that, that Mr. Chakrabarti made about having a Minister of Information. You see, there was this Afghan, uh, Afghan uh, minister who came to Bangladesh and he was asked by the Commission, uh, what do you do? He said, I am the Minister of, 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 of uh, Shipping. And the but there is no, you don't have uh, rivers or you have land or country, you don't have seas around you. So what? You don't have law and order, but you have minister of law. So you don't have to have a, a, the presence of, 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 of a phenomena to have a ministry. Well, banter apart. So as I was saying, resilience is the ability to sort of uh, create a situation. Uh, which 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 is which evolves and which allows you to tackle uh, disturbances, uh, coercive influences, uh, in a manner that will allow you, as a state, as a nation, as individuals, to play your part in the development of the nation. And here, the centrality is the people. You cannot talk of national interest without talking of the people. Uh, as, I, as I'll come later on, who defines national interest and what national interest consists of. So it is, it is, it is people, centrality, the people's role, and involvement of the people. And how do you involve the people? Is the achievement of the cloud in planetary, where you have the state, you have the people, and the link is the media. So media is the link in so far as an exercise of national security and national interest is concerned. So then let us go on to asking ourselves what is national security and what is the media. I may sound very, very, very uh, sort of sort of very uh, simplistic and asking ourselves, what is the media? It's very obvious. It is not as it appear subsequently. And thank you for the two speakers for bringing out the, the, the concept of national security. 
these things in market demand. National security has variegated explanations. There is no one definition of national security. But to me, it, it is the ability of a state, of a people, of a nation to exist in an atmosphere which can resist, as I said, coercive influence in your functioning efficiently, freely, both internally and externally, to, for, for the betterment of the people as a whole, for the greater good of the greater majority. Now, national security can, 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 can includes a vast array of things, and not security of any individual, any organization, or any particular entity. And uh, the national security has also the concept has, has enlarged over the years. Where from the realist, realistic definition or status definition of, 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 uh, of uh, security, we have gone to the people centric definition of security. Now, security is constant, national security. It is not episodic. It doesn't depend on any particular, particular occurrence and it's not played by years, but you factor it, factor it in, in your, in your policy planning matrix. Now, as I said, security is based on three factors. Idealist and good governance. There is a symbiosis between national security and good governance. What good governance gives you? or attempts to give you is a society that is negative end, is a society that is run by the rule of law and not women, is a society where law is the king and, 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 people, and people do not make laws to suit individuals or regimes. Uh, let me quote a famous uh, German philosopher, I knew of Emmanuel Kant, and I quote him. He says, people who feel secure and free, governed by the rule of law and not of men, are much less likely to go to war with each other, either with, within or across the borders, than those who don't. So if you are not, people are not secure, if you are insecure, there is likely to be more, there's prospect of more conflict, more unrest, and more, and, and, and more problems. And as, 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 the, as, as the chairman of said, is, multifaceted, a core values, secret interests, challenge and threats. But remember, all vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities and threats of, and, and challenges are not threats. But unless you address them uh, in time, they will mutate into actual threats and impeach on your security interests. I come to the question of who defines security. Very important. Who defines security? Is it the state? Is it, the, is it the military establishment? Uh, is it the media? I mean, I mean, is it the holy cow? Is it the exclusive preserve? But let me predicate my comment on another state. Security is a public good. And the state has the wherewithal to provide that public good. Therefore, perhaps it devolves on it to identify and define what is a threat. threat may not, a threat may not be constant, but a threat, it may vary. And the assessment of threat may vary on the regime that is in power. It may vary from, vary, uh, from government to government, but a threat has to be perceived. This perception of threat and the ability to, 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 to combat it Rest primarily on the state because it has the very thought. But it cannot do it alone. And as referring to the to the planetary, it needs it needs the people and the media because it is the people's interest that you are talking about. So the people have to factor in. <coughs> Let me draw your attention to two, two sort of two events that I recall. Where the issue of national uh, interest uh, uh, came to the fore. If you recall the the Bear Pigs incident, where the New York Times 
it is reported, some see it as a myth, but it is reported that President Kennedy prevailed upon the, uh, the, the editor of the New York Times not to publish yet. He had come by the information that there's going to be an invasion very soon. And the, the editor said that if I don't uh, publish it, then it will impinge the life of many soldiers and the interest of the, America, of the American people and the American nation. Kennedy thought otherwise. The New York Times editor thought otherwise. And it was published, of course, in a very told down manner, eventually it was published. So it was not the president who dictated what nationalism should be. Because the editor of the newspaper thought that if he did not <coughs> publish it, it would, it would affect. The, 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 the biopics, uh, the, the invasion went, went ahead, the disastrous consequences went ahead. But it was published. On the other hand, some say that had this, that report not been curtailed, then perhaps uh, Kennedy would have a sort of sort of discussion that 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 that, that, that uh, invasion. But here I quote you a, a judge, Nazi judge, who in his in his in his uh, remark uh, uh, on the on the bill. On, on, on the Pentagon Papers uh, issue, the Pentagon Papers, the Vietnam Papers, that the government was suppressed, but the, the Washington Post wanted, wanted to print. He said, and I'm putting in, the security of a nation is not at the ramparts alone. Security also lies in the value of free institutions. A cantankerous press, an obstinate press, obstinate press, an ubiquitous press, must be suffered by those in authority in order to preserve and even uh, preserve the even greater value of the freedom of expression and the right of the people to know. So I leave it to judge and be the final arbiter of who who, who defines national security, how it is defined, and who is going to address national security. But let me emphasize on the fact that national security does not transcend public security or public interest. Now, <coughs> with, the, with, with, the, with the changing concept, the, 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 the components have also changed. The components that deal with national security. Uh, you have economic security, you have technology security, you have internal security, and all the rest. And you have the debate of identist and, and, and statist. You have the traditional and the non-traditional so what has happened is that the difference between the peacetime and wartime has blurred. So there's nothing called warfare and peacetime now. But issues which are not conflictive also strike at the roots of a national interest, like global warming, right? Like like uh, issue of issue of common waters. <coughs> so this this do not exist in a Wartime situation, but in this time, but this have an effect on your national security. That is why, and that is where the media comes in. Because the media then becomes a very integral part of national security uh, in peace as well as in wartime context. So therefore, media is an important element of national security. This is what I was trying to come to. Let's come to the media, having discussed the national security. Do we have some time? Five minutes? It's been 60 seconds or 20 minutes. No, so. no. Let me come to the media. Well, it has been called the fourth state, and not for nothing. And you know the background of why it was called the fourth state. And calling the media fourth state with Edmund Burke, perhaps one in 1797. First, first, he did not coin the word, but used the word to make to, 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 to refer to the media. And when he was making his speech in the in the House of Commons, it was the first time in the history of Britain that the press was allowed into the parliament. And he referred to the media that you have to be very careful 
about the fourth state, the other three states being the king, nobility, the clergy, and the common people. The fourth state, the press, the media become the fourth state, and in, in terming the media, in, in, in sort of the appellation, the honorific of, of, of the fourth state, arrogated to the media, uh, it became a metaphor for power. It, 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 was, it, was, it was the power of mania that was, that was conveyed in, 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 in Germany as the fourth, fourth state. Now, the media has become now more Catholic. I'm not in the, in the religious sense. It, 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 it has a large footprint. So it is not only the press, but it has, it has the social media. It has so, so many other platforms. So what has happened is, it has created a different dimension, the fourth dimension for the military, of course, but also for the for the state, for the administration. You have this, you have the land, you have the sea, you have the you have the, you have the water. Now you have the cyber space. So that has that has become uh, the, the fourth dimension, and that has created more complex situation. Consequently, but what has what has, what has also happened as a consequence is that the media is now being is being used. The important media has been has been has been has been conceptualized, has been acknowledged not only by the by the press but also by the non-state actors. At one point in time. The, the Taliban's or the IS were very averse to having to do anything with the media. But eventually, the Taliban like, like organization had organized a very strong uh, and, and a very vibrant media wing of itself. So that is that is that is the change, that is the change, the change in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the treatment of the media. So this is the, the fourth dimension. I will emphasize a bit more on the power of the media. Now, had I called Thomas Jefferson, who had said, given a choice between a government without a media and a media without a government, I will choose the latter. He would choose the media without the government. No, 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 that's the thing. Now, another uh, famous uh, American, black American, he had said, the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent. And that's power because they control minds of the masses, Malcolm X. <clears throat> and Randall Hart, you have heard of him, who says, media, newspapers control. Well, then there was no other media except the newspaper. Newspapers control the nation because they represent the people. So you see the link. The inherent link, state, media, and the people. Now the problem is that the loyalty, when the loyalty of the media is to the people, and they and they represent the people's wills, people's aspirations, people's views, people's apprehension. The the, the admin, the power, the government in power takes it to be a position that is animus to the government. Because anything that is pro people, some government, I'm, I'm, I'm relating it to, to, to not only to our case but generally, that it is then, it is then, the media is then considered as something that is anti government. And that is where the problems of the media comes in. And in, in many countries, attempt is made to suppress the media, either directly or indirectly. To snap the media, to stifle the media. Very often on the plea of national security and national interest. So sometimes uh, it remains very elusive in public mind as to what is national interest and what is national security. But let me remind you the power of the media, particularly in the, in, in the, in the context of war and conflict. Here, the to Vietnam situation. I'm quoting a US Marine who says, In Fallujah, we weren't beaten by terrorists and insurgents. We were being eliminated effectively. We were beaten by Al Jazeera. CNN effect. Our enemies won the information war. Now, another 
famous general is now not. He says, what we still don't understand is why you went, and I'm telling, I'm, I'm reading this out to emphasize on the power of the media, is why you Americans stopped the bombing of Hanoi. You had us on the ropes. If you had pressed on a little harder, just for another few days, we were really ready to surrender. But we were ready to notice that your media were helping us. So the Vietnam War was lost in the campus, in the Berkeley campus at home, not in the fields of in Vietnam. Let me again infer the fact that the media is a national institution. The free press perhaps only institution which has been acknowledged in our constitution. Free press and right to free expression. Article 32, 33 to a free So that is, that is, that is the importance of the, of, of the media. To safeguard national security, safeguarding national, uh, national interest also is an exercise that cannot, that cannot overlook the media. Okay, I was talking about the fourth state and the role of the fourth state. And I put to you the question whether the media has actually lived up to the reputation of what it should be, the watchdog. But media has also some constraints. What is the constraint? It is lack of, lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge about the military. They do not know the difference between a Legal by a blunder bus. They do not know the difference between, between a tank and a gun and a AK. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. The military hasn't made uh, uh, effort to integrate, in, in, integrate the media. So what happens is they go for information. They go for the lowest hanging fruit. Because they run out of time, they have a time to they have, they have the stop press, they have, they have, they have, they have, they have time to wait, the, the editors edit the time, the news have to wait. So sometimes those news are patchy, those news are informed, and perhaps sometimes misconstrued also. So I think that lack of knowledge is important. But the, 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 the media's role also depends on how much the administration, the government is willing to take it on board to, to, to sort of make it a joint and collaborative effort. As I was saying, coming to the fourth state, the watchdog role, accountability, particularly in an environment where the institutions have been rendered, have, have been, have been sort of rendered important by government policies, where a rule of law is non-existent, where, 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 you know, where, you know, where, where, uh, uh, where agencies uh, uh, do not fun function as per their constitutional provisions. The fourth state is very important, accountability is important. But my question is, in, in performing terms of the watchdog board, have the media in Bangladesh, and I leave it to for the questions, have the Bangladesh, or in any other country, uh, been able to, able, able, able to perform this, this, this duty. For example, let's take the case uh, of the United States, where, where a president had come media the enemy of the people. Where our next door neighbor uh, uh, suppressed the media. It was never, I've never seen media in so much of constraint as in, as in recent years. I've been involved in journalism for 20 years. I've been the Indian journalist for a very long time in the media. But the concerns that the Indian media is succumbed to this force. And it's not India or Bangladesh. Even in the United States, the media succumbs. We have the case of Asir Washington Post at the New York Times. But you also the case where the, the, the Rumsfeld, Bush, and Cheney triangulates uh, formulation, the Iraq had the bomb, was propagated by the, by the, by the, by the American media. They succumbed to the pressure. And it turned out to be false. So therefore, the fourth state, are we being able to, what, when it's RBI, I'm worried with the general term, and the media being able to perform this duty to the, to the, to the, to the satisfaction. As I said, 
one of the roles of the media is to create awareness. You can't create awareness until the media is well informed itself. Now, influencing the public mind is another important, important task of the media. But if the media is not informed, if the media is half baked, if the media is half cocked, then what will have is half baked information, half baked uh, background knowledge. Now, 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 I think it's not for nothing that that uh, a British author had said. Well, he was he was an Irish. He said, "There is much to be said in favor of modern journalism. By giving the opinion of the uneducated, it keeps us in touch with the ignorance of the community." And now this was said almost 150 years ago. Uh, I think he had our our society in mind when when he talked about this. But a good media, a rapid, media, educated media, well informed media helps in, 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 in formulation of plans. It helps in account, asking for accountability of, of, the, of this government. For national security issues, it already informs the public, but also asks the government to, to, to come up with the policies and the basis for the policies that are, uh, and, and, and the action they are taking in order to make the public informed as to what is being done in the, in the context of the interest of the public. So therefore, it is very important for us to keep in mind that the media, to have a well-informed media, it, it also depends on the willingness of the government as to how much is going to, is, 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 is going to, is, is going to accommodate and make it into a team. There are a few other aspects which, which I, 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 will, I will not cover here, but just, just, just to say that, the do's and don'ts for, for, for the media in information and public awareness are the same. I think our media is given to over dramatization. Over dramatization. Our media is given to sometimes irresponsible reporting. Uh, objective accuracy is lacking. We must avoid glorifying issues. We must avoid glorifying violence. We must avoid personalizations. Doing anything that will give oxygen to the anti-state, to the terrorists, to the to the extremists. And we must not aggravate our reports, our our our, our statements must not aggravate the situation. And here, very important aspect of con conflict sensitive journalism. A very good example of bad journalism in our country was when this lady purported to be a to be a very very good uh, or claiming to be a very good journalist was laying directly the BDR massacre. Remember that? I think it was very insensitive. The the, 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 the that, that particular channel and that she had no idea of what was reporting, what she was done. Even the CNN does not. Even in even the scene does not telecast uh, live directly. There is a 30 second gap between what the what the reporter on ground passes on to the 30 second gap for them to see whether something should be done. So it was a very stupid and a very good example of bad reporting. <coughs> Similarly, I was shocked to see the Indian media giving the running commentary of the of their army action on Taj Hotel. As if we were a commentary match. Couple that is coming and bowling. Here the Indian army, the, 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 the aircraft is landing. Now if they're coming down, they're going to rappel and they're showing the thing. They're rappelling down, they're going to this. Conversely, I was watching live on BBC in 1980. <coughs> when I was doing stuff with Camille. The 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 the, the Iranian hostage right? Yes, we were told that the action will take place. When, when, when the thing was open, and after three and a half hours, we got the news that the 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 the, the, uh, the extremists have been uh, rendered ineffective, a few casualties, and that sort. Of. Nothing more than that. Nothing more than that. But here we try to con so therefore the importance of conflict sensitive. Journalism. Very important thing what the media does. 
When you talk about national security, national interest, media, fighting extremism, there's the important role that the media plays in countering violence extremism, which I have not covered, is one of one of the points for lack of time, which I have not covered. Uh, but yes, one more, one more, one more minute, and I'll finish. So the, when 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 you talk about the national law and and, and and national national security issues, it is very important, and I am making it up. Uh, against government violation of the rule of law or abridgment of human rights of the citizens or disregarding the need for social justice by keeping them informed and making clear the need that this effort to provide more security to the people should not mean less of human rights and rule of law. The twin challenges of the state to combat violence yet maintain the rule of law must not be lost sight of. I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your very well-developed deliberations. Um, you bring on a very pertinent point about security identification. S identification, the security needs of a state is not static. It's a dynamic process. Except for the sovereign borders that we are safeguarding, everything else is more or less dynamic and they have to be constantly updated. For example, today, you can have a secure border yet you can lose everything by cyber attacks. This is not the case a couple of years back. A state can be completely rendered defeated with a comprehensive cyber attack from another state or another entity. So the process of identification of national security is dynamic and in the dynamic process both the citizens, the media and the security sector plays equal roles. The process of securitization is a process where the media and the citizens have to be involved so that the right identification of securitization process takes place. So having said that, the floor is now open. Please feel free to ask your questions and give your comments. But we have limited time, so please be very brief when you make an intervention. We will first have the ambassador here. Excellency of the floor. Thank you very much, uh, to Ron and Ian. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, thank also the three, uh, our three panelists this morning who uh, uh, made very interesting uh, presentations, points, uh, remarks, uh, about which I would have uh, many additional uh, observations to make. But of course, <clears throat> I, will, I will just limit uh, myself to a few, um, I think, interesting uh, aspects of our discussion. Um, first of all, I, I would like to say that, as it was mentioned, countries, national security is not only about <clears throat> physically uh, guaranteeing uh, the integrity of our borders and of our territories by the uh, army and, and the military, etc. It also, of course, about values. We have, um, it's not a typically French um, concept, but I think we, uh, we put it very high up in our uh, system um, when we talk about the fundamental interests of the nation. So there are lots of uh, uh, very important uh, decisions and opinions by our constitutional court and our uh, state council about what it is exactly uh, that is behind this idea of the uh, fundamental interests of the nation. What do you put in there and how do you uh, guarantee that they are preserved and protected? That's one point. So I would like to go <clears throat> beyond the military aspects of uh, this morning's discussion. I will give you now two examples. The first one was a kind of a wake-up call. Because, of course, one of the main, the central um, <clears throat> goal of when you're talking about protecting the fundamental interests of the nation is the uh, necessity of preserving uh, our democracy, preserving the stability of our institutions, and 
eventually the happiness of our people, if possible. So the wake up call was in 2017. Uh, we had presidential elections in France at the uh, time. And um, per our rules, the electoral campaign with candidates going on TV, radio, media, etc., has to stop uh, two days before the actual election day. First round and second round. So we have election on Sunday. Uh, so on Friday evening, fr Friday evening, all the candidates are absolutely forbidden, and of course their official campaign people are absolutely forbidden to go to the media, including now to express themselves uh, on the social media, etc., etc., because it could influence the people without giving the right to the other ones, to their government, to answer, etc. So we leave to the people a full day of reflection of all they have heard during the campaign so that they can, in a full serenity, come and cast their vote uh, after that. On the first, uh, on the eve of the first round of our presidential campaign in 2017, on, on the Friday late afternoon, um, came out what turned out to be an information manipulation operation um, was leaked, were leaked a flurry of emails and documents attached to these emails from Emmanuel Macron's campaign, electoral campaign. And of course, it was too late for uh, Mr. Macron and his campaign to talk about this and say this is true, not true, whatever he would have wanted to say, and for his opponents to counter-argue, it was too late. But still, uh, our main media, TVs, of course, would do a job and take this, these leaked emails and talk about it on Friday evening. So people then, what would be the result? People would think, wow, this candidate, Emmanuel Macron, is because he couldn't answer to uh, uh, him. It's a very bad candidate. He's been doing very bad things because, of course, these leaked emails were absolutely horrendous about things which were supposed to have happened within the, uh, his own team, uh, what he tried to do to opponents, blah, blah, blah. Very bad, very negative things for him. And he couldn't answer. So what... What was done um, was to go and talk to the main media, make phone calls, and ask them, be responsible. Don't talk about this, because it will be unfair. Um, Mr. Macron himself will not be able to talk about it. Um, the other candidates will feel obliged to say something if you you talk about it, so it's unfair because there is no time. And it is the purpose of these leaked emails, which we understand are faked emails. It's a, a, an operation, an informational operation. Uh, so please refrain from talking about it. And they did. They did. Like in the 60s, there were lots of phone calls from the Ministry of Information that we had at that time, that we don't have anymore. So in 2017, although we didn't have a Ministry of Information, some phone calls were made from the present government before the elections, who was not going to stay in power, uh, to ask the media not to talk about this, because uh, it would completely bias the behavior of the voters. And probably this was the goal which was in the mind of the people who organized, who orchestrated this uh, informational operation. And the media accepted not to talk about it. So they showed their, it's a, I think it's, it was uh, um, 
showing their maturity because they understood this would completely destabilize our democratic institutions. But of course, after the day of voting uh, passed, the media talked about it, but there were arguments, debates, and the candidate could defend himself, argue, counter-argue, etc., etc. But it was a wake-up call because uh, at that time, uh, we didn't make public what was the origin of this operation, informational operation, uh, because it was not our policy to make this public. Now this has changed. Uh, but it was a wake-up call for, uh, for us. This led to the creation of a government agency, which is directly under the prime minister in France, called Viginum, or Digital Vigilance, Vigilance Numérique, Digital Vigilance, whose uh, task is to make sure that uh, if any uh, foreign digital interference happens, then uh, we will be, still be protected. So to investigate into the methods uh, that are used in case there is such uh, a digital interference from a foreign uh, entity, state or non-state, and look into it, uh, uncover it, and then make it public. And this happened, there was a massive, one of them, but this one was particularly massive, uh, foreign digital interference going against the protection of the fun fundamental interests of the nation, which was uncovered by the end of 22, early 23. It's the results have been made public, including in English, so I will leave it to you, but easy to, to find on the uh, internet and Twitter and all that. The, <clears throat> the main method used by, uh, in that case, the Russians, and we said it publicly, it was uh, Russian groups, institutions, and individuals, they were basically uh, using what is called typo squatting. So squatting is to get to a house of someone who is uh, owning uh, the house media, so squatting a media with typos. I will give you an, uh, an example so that you understand. So there has been typo squatting of official French institutions and of a uh, very famous French media. For example, if you take the internet site of your mofa, mofa.gov.bt, okay, so you make a Google search because you want to look something in their website, and you will be directed to a site which you will not pay attention, but it's not the actual MOFA. It's mofa.gov.bm, for example. But you don't pay attention, and it looks, when you open the website, it looks absolutely like your uh, good old uh, MOFA. Same visual, same graphic, etc., etc. But the contents and the uh, front page announcing important current events, etc., will be filled with uh, voluntarily uh, ill-intended content. So we have been facing a massive attack by hundreds, thousands of these uh, typos quoted. Uh, websites, institutions, and uh, media. Uh, our foreign ministry, for example, also was uh, was at. And after we finished to investigate, we published a complete report, which also contains all the addresses uh, of the um, uh, fake websites and also fake uh, social media accounts on very important platforms. So you can find it there. And um, this, I think, in that case, it was useful to, um, to make it public because it, give, it, it will give the actual uh, media a sense of responsibility. 
And of course, what was the goal of this whole operation? It was to, and I will finish there. Uh, the goal of the whole operation, and it was not only taking place in France, it was also in other European states, was to uh, uh, see the level of support of our policy towards Ukraine uh, and the conflict uh, provoked by Russia and Ukraine diminish and to entice our people, our political uh, parties, our public opinion, to express their opposition to our support to, to Ukraine. Uh, so to create, uh, to polarize society around uh, new angles. And uh, this was a very uh, massive operation. So, but I think it was, it is part of national security and directly uh, the role of the media was uh, absolutely central. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Especially for setting the examples that you have in your country. We'll have Ambassador Shamir next, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'll be very short. Uh, I can understand that Pips has uh, great importance to the role of media and national security. That's why, obviously, holding a separate thing like this. Only two weeks ago, we had one on another the role of media. And I thought this aspect of media role could have been subsumed in that. But obviously, it's a very important subject. And uh, thanks to all three panel speakers for their illuminating presentation. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, I haven't heard really much from any of the panelists about uh, the ways and means for, for better coordination between the media and the national security agencies for the purpose of uh, dissemination of info and national security. But the role of media is to dissemination of information. So I'd like to hear from any of them, particularly what role can ISPR play in, uh, in this regard? And maybe uh, religion Chagana could speak on that. And since our last event uh, relating to the role of media was a democracy, I would like to hear from any of the panelists. I mean, the variance at which the media can play in a political system that can be termed as a liberal democracy and the ones that are illiberal democracy, hybrid democracy. Thank you. Thank you. First, uh, please be brief. We are slightly short of time. Uh, <laughs> I am Abhurush and the editor of Bangladesh News and Channel. I have been journalist since 1991. I served in many daily newspapers, then from 2008, I established my own journal, Bangladesh News and Channel. And uh, we will keep close to you. Uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, what I, uh, I have to say many things, but as General Moni has told me to be short, I just go for a joke. Uh, because so many uh, people that are here, they talk about so many things, high courts and other things I say. And uh, probably you do not know, many of you do not know that Brigadier Shahidul Anam Khan, his grandfather was a pioneer of journalism in the subcontinent, yeah. Maulana Akram Khan. And if you go to our National Press Club, you will find his photograph there. Okay, fine. Now, it was the tenure of Field Marshal Ayub Khan in Pakistan. And uh, that was a very good time. The GDP growth was more than 10. There were, were with the American and Western health, it was shining, shining, and shining. So many industrialization, these and that, German uh, air conditioned coaches, <laughs> televisions, and that. And on the other side, India, uh, the GDP growth was 2.3, 2.4, like that. And they were very shabby, 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 and like that. And everybody used to laugh from Pakistan and look at these guys, they cannot eat and that. In that period, one Pakistani dog, a very healthy dog, shining, glittering. And with a lot of pomp, he went to the Wagga border. And uh, there he found one very skinny dog from the other side, Indian part. Very shabby dog, he came. And uh, both of them, yes, guy, where you there, buddy? The Indian dog said, oh, uh, you do not know that you see, you look so good. I heard that the Pakistani government, the uh, field marshal, I found, gave you a lot of facilities and uh, you can get so many food, cheese, these burgers, there's so many things, bones and that. And you look so good, and that's why we cannot eat in, in 
India, we are I want to migrate to Pakistan. Okay, fine. Now, when here at the border, he asked the Pakistani dog. Then the Pakistani dog scratched his head and said, Guys, yes, it's true that Phil Marshall gives, gives us a lot of food, but he doesn't allow us to bark. That's the problem. And then what happens, you know, the Pakistani national security went to the India. Indian national security remained in India. The Shevi dog didn't go to Pakistan, but rather the Pakistani dog went to India. So see, if you don't have the freedom of speech, democracy, then there is no value of national security. No value at all. If you may say that what Her Excellency has already told that democracy is the prime mover of everything. If you consider a media in a communist country like China, like Cuba, like North Korea, like even in some autocratic countries like Myanmar, like Syria, like Iran, it doesn't matter, media doesn't matter. Everything is considered from the net, uh, security point of view, the military, the intelligence services. That's all law enforcement services. And in some pseudo democratic countries also. Uh, so, media can also incite violence. It is true. Media can also incite sectarian, racial, and communal violence in many places. But the responsibility doesn't lie with media only. If a country is democratic, then every 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 say people, every sector of the people, when I say people, they are taken when I combined, they work combined. Say, can you remember the Mai Lai incident, Mai Lai massacre during the Vietnam War? The American media played well with that. It didn't hamper the national security. Rather, it purified the American military attitude. So this is how they got themselves purified. There are a lot of uh, say, uh, incidents. Now look at uh, the uh, say America that Trump. Uh, what is going on with President Trump? It is playing a very good role. If it is played in China, can you imagine? Chinese media cannot write it. So a media in a country like China or Cuba it doesn't matter. And uh, I, uh, the, the, another thing that, do you think that a controlled media plays any role to ensure national security? No, it doesn't. And uh, Mr. Shudip Chakraborty is also a journalist. He pointed out something that the journalists were taken to visit some uh, military instruction, this and that. I had been a military officer. So, I went to, uh, as a journalist, I went to, uh, say, UN visiting missions to see, uh, as a guest of Bangladesh Army. And in 2002, I found that a BNP was in power, that no, no journalist from the Aumalik block was taken. Same is happening now during Aumalik time. No journalist from the other, other group is taken to any places, or even contacted by the military uh, organizations or intelligence organizations or law enforcement agencies. This is how you just cannot ensure anything because national security encompasses everyone, everything. If you don't consider people, if you don't want to listen to criticism, then you will go blind. Yes, military service and law enforcement agencies, this and that, these are two establishment. And journalism is in the establishment. Can we finish? Uh, yes, sir. So, the, uh, okay, sir. Uh, just to <laughs> the conclusion, better have a development journalism and control everything. You will get a good national security. Thank you. Let me know if the floor, please be, be very brief because we are about to end. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, we've heard about uh, the culture of secrecy, you know, our armed forces, as you know, it did rise from this soil in 1971. It was supported by the people, it was raised by the people, and it was fought by the people. There was a conventional uh, 
element and the large guerrillas. Then how that armed forces has become the victim of this culture of secrecy? Is Bangladesh unique? My uh, question to the panel. No. Let's take the example of the you know vanguard of our freedom, United States. Uh, in, okay, uh, France also. But uh, interestingly, uh, in the freedom of uh, uh, you know press index, United States comes 45, 45th. South Africa is 25th. East Timor is uh, within top 10, number 10. And the United States is behind Tonga, Dominican Republic. Despite all the effects of the First Amendment uh, drawn in 1791, that's two and a half centuries uh, old, that amendment it, uh, gives the thing. So there also, you see the First Amendment gives all rights to the media, to whatever they get from whatever source to publish, but it doesn't give any uh, right to the media beyond the rights of the people of uh, America to get access to information. Uh, that's uh, I in a uh, paper. Uh, as far as uh, information uh, the government wants to contain, that is uh, uh, you know, dictated by the presidential order. It says what are the information the government and its control can uh, dish out to the uh, to the general public. That includes media. Media doesn't have any special status uh, there. Now uh, there is the Freedom of uh, Information Act by the Congress. It gives all uh, freedom uh, to access, but they have made the exception of defense and foreign policy uh, matters. Again, the presidential order. It gives a large list of you know, exceptions. So there, if you come to our reality, it is almost the same. What is the culture which has made them uh, so uh, great? You know, the France is also great. Uh, but uh, given all this thing, you see, the uh, uh, our problem is the Official Secrets Act. Is it our problem? Can the panel uh, tell us? Is there any country? where the officials, the government and its paraphernalia is out of secrecy act or secrecy uh, oaths. There is no country in, in, in my opinion. Every country has this. We have uh, official secrecy act 1923. Every country has that. The USA has the same thing. It is the government that is India. It is protected that you do, cannot divulge this thing. That's why in the USA only source let it be Pentagon Papers or all the things which the Washington Post or the New York Times has done, all from unauthorized disclosure leaks. It is not from the authorized source. That's the only source they have. Now, in our case, can the panel suggest us how to go about? Because we have this Official Secrets Act, which binds our government officials and the all in the government. Uh, they, they, they cannot die for the info, information. We have a constitution where uh, Article 39 1 it guarantees the uh, thought and conscience. You can think you will become the prime minister of the country, you'll uh, you know, put A, B, C, D, all money launderers, all corrupt, all in the jail tomorrow. You can think, but the moment you express it, you'll be in the jail. That's, a, that's the problem. The thought and conscience is guaranteed. But when it comes to the freedom of expression and freedom of press, it is under reasonable restrictions by the law and the long list of restrictions in terms of foreign policy, in terms of uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, image of the country and the uh, contempt of the court and the long list of ex ex exceptions. With that, we do not have the culture of interacting with each other. We have the legal barriers, constitutional barriers, with the Americans, after two and a half centuries, they are still finding difficulties to do that. So my uh, ask to the panel would be, how to go about this? How to break this uh, see, Because we are from the people. We belong to the people. And if there is an emergency, 
the people of Bangladesh, they are not going to wait for the formal, uh, you know, defense mechanism. They will take up arms. They will go for the defense of this country, plain and simple. Military has to follow them simply. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, we we will. Did you raise your hand, sir? Do you want to ask a question? No, no. You you want? Okay. Please microphone here. No, so you don't. Yeah, the whole uh, discussion. I, I, I listen to with much pleasure. But I confirm that there is a very big difference in the concept of the Japanese understanding media and the security. Because uh, in, in Japan, if we own national security, there are five components of composition. Military, uh, or the defense, um, intelligence, um, diplomats, but also the, the academics and journalists. Without involvement of journalists, we are not going to form any uh, national uh, defense strategy at all. So they, you are talking all about uh, how you are going to get information from the government about the uh, security strategy. But this is actually the after setting up. But I'm more concerned about how you are going to form your national security through me. That's quite important. And the second thing is that uh, we are also, as a government official, we are always having a difficulty that uh, media is always having a kind of, you know, criticize our idea of national security. Of course, as it's also that expressed that uh, human rights and national security is a controversial by nature. It is not about the country's form. The national security is sometimes oppressed the freedom of expression, the certain degree of the uh, human rights. This is why we have the constitution. Where is the limit? I, I think that France, Japan, we have also have that struggle. If you fight against terrorism, well, where is the room for the uh, human rights? But this is this is the worst situation. We have to come up with a certain degree of thing. So we verify after this with the power of the media. What have we done the right thing or not? The, you know that very uh, eminent case in the uh, UK that Blair was actually criticized after 10 years that his decision on the Green Block and Iraq was strong. So this is this is something what I think that media is doing after the action has come. I have three questions to the um, to the panelists. Uh, are there actually the experts in the uh, media support? on security issues, not only reporting about it, but forming the, uh, the, your, your policy. And second thing is that uh, the, uh, the media can actually affect the security policy of Bangladesh. The third question is that the, uh, why the people, uh, I, I see that quite a very limited reporting here in Bangladesh about the idea of the journalists about the future of security situation here. I, 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 I completely agree that, that uh, the idea of the Marist of Dan and friendship for all, but uh, you know that has something to do with Lincoln's famous uh, address, the Marist of uh, Nan and charity for all. But he is conditioned that if there is a right to do so, you have to fight. So, uh, you know, just repeating the mantra, you can't actually see the reality of your security situation. The media has a very strong, uh, um, how to say, the responsibility to see where Bangladesh is now and what is going to happen in your surroundings. This is not only about that somebody evil are going to change your situation. It is really the change of the, the geopolitical situation. And I, I'm just wondering why people are not reporting much about it. what is the reality of the situation here. That is my question. Thank you. Unfortunately, I'll have to end, so we'll have the last question from Ambassador. You have the floor, and this will be the last intervention. While their elaboration, we, I just I request panelists to, to explain the scope of the national security. 
Hospital, we talk, talked about freedom of press and whatnot. In the New York Times, there's a this logo, it's all the news, free to free. Should you follow what the, whatever the news is like in the view of the, the media to print and without damaging the national security? Thank you. My apology to all those who want to ask questions, but we will have to end because we are slightly over shooting our time. We'll now go back to our panelists in the same order, and each of you will have two minutes to respond to the questions. We'll start with Zafar. I think let me um, address the, the last question. I think what I would ask, um, and you know, I've given um, me and uh, Bria Adam were actually on a similar panel recently with the um, Staff College, with the National Staff College, and you know, we um, addressed this issue there as well. I think what I would suggest is that, you know, uh, editors, news editors, give us the, um, you know, give us the, the freedom to make these decisions, to make these calls. I think you'll find that uh, those who are in positions of responsibility in the media take this responsibility very seriously. And, you know, we certainly think twice, three times, four times before we publish anything, and certainly anything which touches on national security, even touches on any sensitive matter. There's actually a great deal of sensitivity in the media culture here in Bangladesh. In many countries, the media culture really, they have a attitude that if it's true, we can publish it, and we, the, I am not responsible for the um, fallout from what I publish. I will publish and let the chips fall where they may. I cannot concern myself with, um, with what happens after something is published. My sole uh, responsibility is to the facts and to the truth. I actually think in Bangladesh we don't have this, um, this culture. Of course, we bear a responsibility to tell the truth, we bear a responsibility to the facts, but we also are acutely concerned with what the implications and the fallout on individuals, on communities, on uh, certain people may be, and how that uh, and how our reporting impacts that. And so I think we are given this when it comes to the issues of national security. I think we are given the freedom that responsibility will be uh, uh, will be taken uh, by those uh, in the media. I think. Um, the other point I'd like to uh, address in the time available to me is a question was raised about the role of media liberal versus illiberal um, uh, countries. And I think this is it, you see. I think, unfortunately, the uh, space for free media has been shrinking dramatically in Bangladesh over the last, uh, uh, the last decades. And, you know, when it comes to free media, with essentially, I think, when our pounds are partially free, a country, there are various categories. And really, um, I think when you have a situation where uh, a polity is more illiberal than liberal, there's very little role for the media to play. And I think I look back to two decades ago where paradoxically, I mean, I think things were much freer in the media uh, than when I first joined, uh, uh, when, I, when I first came back to Bangladesh and joined the media. And I think what's when it, then you have much better governance because therefore in a situation like that, the media can actually play a role in holding people accountable. And there is actually what you say in the newspapers actually has an impact on public policy. And I think that um, when the government closes, closes itself off from that, uh, uh, from that avenue of feedback, that it's, uh, that it's really losing a very potent weapon in its arsenal. The media is, in a, in a liberal democracy with, a, with a, a full free media, we are the canary in the coal mine. We are the first warning of, uh, of, of anything which is going wrong for the government to see. We are the first people to uh, shine a light on what, uh, on what needs to be uh, exposed. This can actually be a great benefit to a government. And when you don't have that benefit in, 
the same uh, applies in the field of national security. I think you're losing a very potent weapon. And so I think that is actually, um, it's, it's very regrettable that that is kind of the situation which pertains here in Bangladesh. And I think that the ultimate loser is not just the media, which is the loser, it is not just the Bangladeshi people who lose out. I actually think that the government is, it loses out in, a, in an environment such as this. And I'm going to leave it there with this as my final Thank comment. You. Thank you. Thank you, Zabur. Should it? Yes. Um, I just, yeah. Yeah. Or less. Maybe two. Uh, I just addressed two issues here, which are sort of ops oriented. I'm not going to go into concepts and theories and so on and so forth. The gentleman there had a question about how should the, sort of the defense and security establishment sort of reach out to media for media interaction and exchange of views and so on and so forth. I mean, my suggestion, I don't know if it matters, would be that I wouldn't say security establishment as an establishment, because that's a very, in a way, a clumsy way of outreach. Because, and who speaks for the security establishment, right? So I, I think it might make more practical sense, like it happens in other parts of the world, where if separate services, for instance, were to reach out uh, to media separately, I think that would be a more practical way of uh, implementing this interaction the arm, army, the navy, the air force, coast guard, so on and so forth, and with the so which even the intelligence establishment. There is, for the record, an outreach by an intelligence establishments in other parts of South Asia. So there's no reason why interaction cannot happen in Bangladesh from a security perspective or a sort of a, uh, sort of a mutual invitation or understanding perspective. As Mr. Majibha suggested, that's the way to grow a conversation and dialogue in media. And coming to your point, sir, is that um, I think you're absolutely right, but as I kept mentioning in my brief address, I hope that Bangladesh is at, as a, at an inflection point where it's, at, I think, poised in exactly the right place to start engaging in greater dialogue about national security affairs. I see, and that's a very, very good thing that I see, that there is great uh, dissemination and there's great dialogue and even suggestions in media, in Bangladesh, even if it's not relatively free, as the person suggested, about sort of political activity or uh, reform, reforms in the political system, systems of governance. I see a lot of very good, uh, I, I read 14 papers every day in English and Bangla, in Bangladesh, and I see some very informed articles about economic policy, about trade, about investment, and increasingly about foreign policy. These are all good things. But your point is very well taken. I think it needs to also now begin to include the security dialogue. Uh, more than foreign policy, it needs to include that aspect. And I think it will come when there is greater interaction with the media, where the media is not kept in the dark. Nobody is suggesting for a minute to dilute uh, aspects which are protected by the OSA uh, in, in Bangladesh. Nobody is giving out state secrets. And because of OSA, leaks will come unofficial. That's how it works. Right? That's how it really works. So you can't prevent that. Uh, but you can sort of keep that to a trickle by increasing, turning the tap on a little bit and increasing your flow of information which you think can help nation building and national security and then leave it to me there to judge for itself where it wants to travel. But you must have faith in your media to do so. If you want the media to have faith. Thank you. Uh, the last comment from Bill <coughs> Thank you. Uh, what uh, Ambassador Shalim said is, is a function of the of military main relations. And in fact, uh, that is the point that came up uh, during our uh, seminar that we had in the Star College very recently. The role of ice that always comes up. The role of ice bear, whether or not ice bear is adequately staffed, uh, appropriately staffed, uh, staffed to, 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 to fulfill that role. Of a link between the public and the, and, and the military. Admittedly, lack of information leads to speculation. And speculation means also half truths, uh, sometimes untruths. So it is, is it, there is always a tussle between the military and the media, between the establishment and the, and, and the media. The establishment must withhold as much information as possible for some good reasons sometimes. But the media wants more information. So how do we reconcile this? This must be reconciled by the interplay, psychological, 
intellectual interplay of the media and the, and the establishment. I'm not, I'm not uh, coming as military, but the establishment, whether it's military establishment or civil establishment, is to how much to be given. Uh, at what point we say, thus far and no further, uh, without impinging on national security. That has to be decided. And that has been decided unless, uh, cannot be said, unless there is a regular interaction between the, between the, between the, between the media and the establishment, the media and the military. And here the military needs to go public, to talk to the public, to explain to the public what is the under incident, if the media must come as quickly as possible to the public before speculative reports um, uh, uh, find, find their way to the, to, to, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the media, to, to print. It's very important. Uh, we have not been able to establish the, the, the I square in the way that we'd like to, and you've suggested that it needs to be, to be, to be, to be revamped. Um, uh, to, I mean, to be to better, better organized, uh, but, but, but uh, there is there is there is there is always the attitude of managing the media, of of of, of sort of sort of uh, controlling the media. We don't manage the media, we involve the media. So that's an attitude of mine also. It's an attitude of mine. Once involve the media, once the involved in the media understand that they are also stakeholder in what is being published. Importance of, 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 the, of the message that is being in the news. So, if they are a stakeholder, I think uh, the media is our media. Our media is very, 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 very mature media. It's, it's not that it's not. They've gone through a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of turmoil. They played a part. Uh, 47, uh, 62, 69, 71, and 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 even after that, they have played a very mature role. So, therefore. There's no need. There's no need to think that the media is not adequately, uh, is not adequately uh, equipped to deal with these national security issues. But it, it, it depends on the attitude of mind of the establishment. Uh, so function of 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 uh, I used to talk about the controlled media, and I wrote I wrote I wrote a I wrote an article uh, four or five years ago. Uh, uh, it star, you know, with the surrender of the fourth state. And my conclusion was I read it. When journalists become a part of the establishment, one that they are supposed to hold to account for its action and inactions, they fulfill the moral authority to play that role. And instead of being a watchdog for the people, they become a laptop. So we decide whether you be a watchdog or the laptop. You cannot be part of the establishment and yet be a watchdog. So that is that is that is where the media's role comes in. Once you succumb to pressure or to the keep of support. Yes, this culture of this culture of secrecy. There's the Official Secrets Act. Again, as I said, uh, I think it was answering uh, Shami's question. I think your question is answered. Is that there has to be there has to be mental meeting meeting of the meeting of the mind, and is that you understand? Yeah, we are bound to Official Secrets Act. But 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 when it comes to the national public interest, it cannot be held as held as an excuse not to not to divulge information when it must be done. Uh, uh, Your Excellency, you, you talked about whether we are experts on issues. No, no experts, no experts, no enforcement. Experts. They can't tell the difference between a, between a truth and a, and, and a rocket launcher. Very clear. So, 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 whose fault is it? And whose fault is it? It's not the fault of the media. In fact, when I became the Sort of, I went on the research at the different study issues that is there. I was the first to start uh, the visit, uh, media visit to UN peacekeeping areas. The people were not aware of what our, our offices were, our men were doing in various peace operations. And as I started this annual trip to various mission areas to make the people aware of the problems that we were going through, uh, they visited the peacekeeping office. It was my idea, I had suggested that you should have a regular discussion, like a training session of two, three weeks in, in, in various uh, formations, Army, Navy, Air Force, and, and, and sort of praise them. Uh, why the Army organized, how it even organized, what various weapons, equipment, all sorts of things. It has fallen on their head. It should, I still should have added that, but they have not. But, sir, remember. HR is very important, as I said. I mean, I mean, more security does not mean less human rights. You, that has to be understood. 
more simple, there is not being less simple. So when giving uh, giving special security to you, they do this. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot subvert the human rights. You cannot, you cannot subvert the human rights. Uh, Thank you. I think we are coming to the end of our discussion today. And this has been a rich discussion, no doubt about it. In conclusion, I would only like to say that the role of the media in national security is multifaceted and it's critically essential. It acts as a beacon of truth, an agent of accountability, and a defender of public interest. And as the media continues to evolve in the digital age, let us remember that its impact on national security will remain indelible, shaping the course of our nation's history and our nation's security needs. With those comments, I would like to thank you all for being with us today for a rich discussion on a very important and a critical issue which is not often discussed in Bangladesh. But I'm sure that with your contribution, we have had a very rich discussion on this critical issue. Please join me in thanking our panelists for the deliberations. They have been wonderful. And may I now request to you to join us for a cup of coffee outside. Thank you.